Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark. I'm a bookseller here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Um, before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming events by visiting powells.com. In the coming weeks, we're looking forward to welcoming many authors, and at the start of April, we'll be returning to in-person events as well as virtual events. So um, look for our calendar. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Sarah J and Anthony Swafford. Um, Sarah J, Sarah Faye, sorry, excuse me, Sarah Faye um, is an author and activist. Her writing appears in many publications, including Longreads, uh, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Time Magazine, The New Republic, McSweeney's, The Believer, and The Paris Review, where she served as an, an advisory editor. She's a recipient of the Hopwood Award for Literature, as well as grants and fellowships from several places, including the McDowell Colony. She's here tonight with her new book, Pathological, which explores the ways we pathologize human experiences and offers a searing critique of the handbook of modern psychiatry. Over the course of 25 years, doctors diagnosed Sarah with six different conditions, anorexia, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity dis disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and bipolar disorder, which is a really hard sentence to say cleanly. Uh, pathological is the gripping story of the factors that led to those diagnoses and the impact each had on her life. Eliza Griswold, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Amity and Prosperity, says this book is a triumph of the spirit and the flesh. And Anthony Swafford, author of Jarhead, says masterfully written, distinctively researched, deeply humane, genius. Um, who better then to join Sarah in conversation than Anthony Swafford himself? He served in the US Marine Corps and is the author of Jarhead and Exit A. Jarhead was described by a Michiko Kakatani in the New York Times as not only the most powerful memoir to emerge thus far from the last Gulf War, but also a searing contribution to the literature of combat, a book that combines the black humor of Catch-22 with the savagery of Full Metal Jacket and the visceral detail of the things they carried. And um, Michiko Kakatani is hard to please, so I uh, think that's very high praise. Uh, this evening's event will also include a Q&A please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's not far from the chat button. If you'd like to ask a question, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can give that a little thumbs up, upvote to put it to the top of the list. Um, that's me. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Sarah Fay and Anthony Swap. Thanks, Mark. Hey, sir. Um... Welcome. It's, it's great to meet you. Uh, we met over email, I think, about nine months ago uh, when your, your book first landed in my inbox. And, um, you know, people always say this and they, they say this in the, in the blurbs. Like I read it in a sitting, but I really did. And, and I did something that I've actually never done before. I, I read about 100 pages in an afternoon. Or I think I emailed you and I said, I'm 100 pages in. This is fucking brilliant. Um, and, and then I, I spent the day, uh, the rest of the evening, I think, ignoring my children and, and, and finishing your book. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be sitting here with you. Um, I, I loved pretty much every page of it. Uh, you know, uh, your in interrogation of, of not only your own life and your own uh, tender, um, somewhat disturbing experiences with uh, the DSM and and uh, mental health uh, care um, and um, I just I, I don't know I, I finished it and I wanted more and and, and uh, maybe we should save it to the end but I, I'm glad to know that you're already working on a sequel. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think every writer's you know, the, the question we hate most in one of these is what's next and you already know what's next so that's exciting. But um, en enough for me right now. Uh, wh why don't you talk a bit and do a reading, and then and then we'll we'll talk. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here, Tony. It means a lot to me. I sort of just uh, you know approached Tony on Facebook. He we didn't know each other, and and he's just been amazing. So I'm really grateful. Um, I also want to thank Powell's and Mark and Ariel and everyone for having me. It's really great. So I'm gonna read just a little bit from Pathological and just to explain, it has three strands. So the book has three woven aspects 
And one is my narrative of receiving six different mental health diagnoses or diagnoses that come from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM, often referred to as Psychiatry's Bible. So I received those between the ages of 12 and 42 was when I got my last one. And so um, that's the first sort of narrative of from the age of 12 on and receiving those diagnoses and not really knowing what they meant or what they were about. And then there's the strand where I investigate what mental health diagnoses are. Like, what are these diagnoses that we get and are they reliable and who invented them and where do they come from? And then there's another strand that's a history of punctuation because I'm obsessed with punctuation and really interested in that. So just to give you an idea of the book, and then I'm gonna read from a scene or two from about halfway in through the book, and then just a page out of the prologue. And all you need to know, it's about seven or eight minutes. And then all you need to know is that at this point, I've been diagnosed with bipolar one, and or otherwise known as manic depressive disorder, and I'm living with my mother. I'm no longer able to live independently. And I'm in my early 40s. And I think that's all you need to know. After Googling for some time, I found a bipolar specialist. It seemed too good to be true, an expert in my particular illness, my diagnosis, my bipolar. Dr. M would be all to me, psychiatrist and therapist. The waiting room of his office offered filtered water and little Dixie cups. On the phone, he'd said we'd meet to determine if we were the right fit. I'd already talked myself into believing that he, the bipolar expert, would help me make sense of my life, my thoughts, my diagnosis, my mind, once and for all. The door opened. A blonde, bright, but serious man poked his head out and called me in. He wore a comfy looking cardigan sweater. His blonde hair was stiff and well coiffed. He was young, but gave off an air of quiet confidence. I stood and followed him down a hallway of closed office doors behind which were the other psychiatrists in his practice. His office was windowless and small. I sat on the gray couch, fake leather and overly cushioned. He sat in a desk chair close by. On his desk behind him was a can of grapefruit LaCroix. It read, naturally essence sparkling water. Essenced seemed to come from a place where water sparkled and nothing ever went wrong. For 40 minutes, he asked me about my mental health history and a bit about my life. I told him about the other diagnoses and the hospital in Iowa and the image of me in the bathtub in Chicago, all of it. When we finished, I asked if I was bipolar. He was the expert, he would know. Turning to his desk, he picked up the LaCroix can. I wondered if he'd mind that it was warm. He faced me again, can in hand. Yes, I was bipolar. He slipped his finger under the tab and opened the can. When the scent of grapefruit reached me, it tasted of relief. That night, I filled out the life chart Dr. M had assigned me. Seated at the desk in my mother's study, I colored in the graph provided, blocking out years and writing in events, shading the highs and lows that could be considered bipolar episodes. It had the look of real data, bars jutting above the zero axis, the normal axis, and others falling below it. Months when the black mass or sodden pit in my stomach was there and my mind slowed. Days and weeks when the splintering and cracking happened and I'd felt an urgent need to run or walk or dance to music only I could hear. The grandiose plans I'd had to finish my dissertation in three months, which I did, and still had to finish my novel in about the same time, which I didn't. My life was no longer divided into weeks and months and years. It was made up of manic and depressive episodes. I leaned back in my chair and stared down at the chart. 20 years of hypomanic highs and depressive lows. 20 years of undiagnosed bipolar disorder. I put down my pen. My sessions with Dr. M revolved around my illness. His questions reframed events and interactions in terms of my bipolar. My past became reordered. Memories played at a slower or faster speed. The motivations behind this or that decision were different now that I saw them through the lens of bipolarity. His presence, just his presence, promised I'd never be suicidal again. The time between our sessions was interminable. Always there loomed the threat of another episode, depressive or manic, worse than the one before, 
Only he had the answer. With him, I managed my new life with someone with bipolar. Managed was a word I heard a lot then. Manage meaning handle. Manage meaning cope. I learned more about bipolar disorder than any lay person should know. I subscribed to BP Hope, a magazine for people with bipolar. The My Story column featured people who revealed their long battles with bipolar disorder, a country musician, an ex-model, a lawyer. I turned page after page of drug ads for Latuda and Abilify and other antipsychotics to the, to the Ask the Doctor column, which covered the many medications I had to choose from. My mother asked to read it because she wanted to learn how to better support me. I let her. When she finished, she handed me the magazine and her face was clouded with concern. Are you sure you wanna read that? I said, of course, and asked why. It's just so dark. The internet offered so much information, so much contradictory information about the natural remedies I could add to. Folic acid and vitamin B12 were crucial, crucial to sound mental health. No, magnesium was. A high fat, low carb diet caused depression. No, a low fat, high carb diet did. Green and black teas were high in the amino acid L-thionine, which relieved stress and anxiety, but caffeine triggered manic episodes. The Mediterranean diet was the key to relieving de depression, but only in smokers. Blogs on the Harvard Health website reported that there was overwhelming evidence for a connection between food and mental health, though others insisted further studies were urgently required to elucidate whether a true causal association exists. I scrolled down the Medical News Today website, passed an ad for Vralar, an antipsychotic as yet unknown to me, to be told once again that bipolar might be caused by a chemical imbalance that may or may not be helped by fish oil and vitamin C. Website after website confirmed that my prognosis was grave. With the diagnosis of bipolar, my life expectancy had shortened by nine to 20 years. The illness would worsen over time, each manic or depressive occurrence increasing that likelihood. With each depressive episode, my risk of dementia also rose. There was a very good chance I'd never have a long-term relationship or hold a regular job. I'd relapse, I'd end my own life. The inevitable was coming. Early death, more frequent episodes, relapses, suicide. I admitted to myself that I was, in fact, living, not just staying with my mother. I registered with a disability at one of the universities where I worked. My diet was impeccable, my sleep regular when I wasn't in an episode, and my schedule precise. I rarely went out at night or during the day, except to teach, walk, and run. I wrote my novel, I read, I watched Netflix, I prepped classes, I taught. I lost count of the number of times Dr. M told me how ill I was. The premise of our work together was that I was very, very sick. Occasionally he agreed with person first consideration that I was someone with a mental illness, not mentally ill. I was, as the cliche goes, more than my illness. It's not as if I could have questioned my diagnosis. Not admitting I was bipolar indicated a lack of insight or what's called anisognosia, which meant I was in denial, which meant I was sicker than I thought. And I'm just gonna read a page from the prologue. It's too easy to lay blame, but I do. I blame a book, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM. How can I blame pages, words, letters, dots, dashes, lines, marks on paper? Because the DSM is powerful. Jeffrey Lieberman, former president of the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, called it, quote, the most influential book written in the past century. Sociologist Alan Horowitz writes that it controls the diagnoses we receive and how we think about them, which would be fine if the DSM had scientific merit which it doesn't. Some of the most prominent psychiatrists have referred to DSM diagnoses as constructs and placeholders. Others have admitted that they have no reality, pathologize normality, or are made up. As former National Institute of Mental Health Director Thomas Insel put it, we quote, actually believe these diagnoses are real, but there's no reality, end quote. Alan Francis, one-time chair of the DSM-4 task force, is quoted as saying that DSM diagnoses confuse, quote, mental disorder with everyday sadness, anxiety, grief, 
disappointments and stress responses that are an inescapable part of the human condition. Stephen Hyman, another former NIMH director called DSM diagnoses fictive categories and the DSM quote, an absolute scientific nightmare. But I didn't know DSM diagnoses were invented and had no validity and little reliability until it was almost too late. Validity, which is considered the most fundamental pr principle in medicine, would mean that DSM diagnoses can be objectively measured, which they can't. Reliability assumes that multiple clinicians presented with the same patient can rely on the symptoms listed in the DSM and will consistently agree on the patient's diagnosis, which they can't. It's tempting to fault the DSM's authors, those members of the APA who wielded those words and punctuation marks. How else did so many unproven diagnoses end up on the most recent editions? Many, many, many pages. Over the editions, the number of diagnoses and spectrums and subtypes has grown and grown. The DSM-5 clocks in at 947 pages with 541 diagnostic categories compared to the scant 132 pages and 128 categories in the DSM-1. The DSM's authors might defend themselves by saying they just wanna make sure that those who need care receive a diagnosis, even if, and they leave this part out, DSM diagnoses are speculative at best. It's also tempting to reproach the psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers who level DSM diagnoses, even though they know those diagnoses are unproven. They claim they have to label a patient with a diagnostic code to satisfy the insurance company to get paid, even if, and they leave this part out, it means letting a patient believe she suffers from a diagnosis that's essentially theoretical. And pharmaceutical companies who've benefited from the DSM's revisions and the academic psychiatrists and researchers who have profited from and built their careers on pathologizing normal distress. But the words, so convincing, do the most damage. They've taken on a life of their own. The DSM has become, as some say, a work of culture. It's socially sanctioned. Many, many people believe it's a scientifically proven medical manual. It's not not even close. Thank you. Thanks. Um, when, when was the DSM-1 published? Can you re remind 1952. me? 1952. 52, okay. So we're, uh, how many years later is that? 70 years later and it's grown like by 400 diagnoses. And, uh, yep. So um, have you hired protection from the DSM and big pharma hitmen? No. Uh, I think big pharma, I don't know, but it's it's been really interesting as I've been doing publicity for the book. I thought psychiatry would really push back at me and I'd get all this sort of flack, even from my own psychiatrist, who, by the way, I still have a psychiatrist. I'm still on medication. Mental illness is real. I want to just preface with that. Um, but a psychiatrist I've talked to across the board have said, we know, we're sorry. We know, like, and it's, it's an even worse response than them pushing back because it means, wow, we're just sort of stuck in this really difficult situation. Yeah, yeah, I thought you'd get a lot of a lot of pushback actually when I read it. Um, I bet you still will. Um, <laughs> or, I mean, I, I don't think, yeah, because um, that seems like this sort of like they're living in this. That that's that's admitting that um, something's really really wrong here. And yet, uh, you know, we'll still keep using these placeholders, as, as you call them. Um, so, so what genre do you consider the book? Um, because I, you know, there's uh, auto theory is something that's kind of thrown around a lot right now. But I, I think you're you're sort of like working a few intellectual stories higher than than, than what what is called what, what we call auto theory these days. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you consider the thing you wrote? Or, or did you care about genre as, as you wrote, as you embarked? I cared about it once I wanted it to be out there. You know, as I tell my students, you know, if you, if you want people to read it, you're gonna have to have a genre, most likely, because they people have to sell the book and that has to fit in a category. And it's interesting to think of categories when we talk about the DSM and mental health sure. diagnoses, it's all categories. and you know, they're useful um, to some degree. I've been calling it a journalistic memoir. I haven't really okay. known what else to call it, but just so people know, I have over 500 citations in the book. 
I was really aware of the fact that I had received so much misinformation and there's so much misinformation on the internet that I wanted people, you know, really to be giving people um, information that came only from peer reviewed journals and academic sources for the most part. And so that's why I took that. I actually just wrote a piece about it in Poets and Writers called the Fully Fact Check Memoir. And basically kind of questioning in memoir, we always, we've had this, I don't want to call it an obsession, but we've had this preoccupation with is a person lying about their past? Are they telling the truth about this person or this experience? And what I, the issue I was raising is it might be more problematic to think of what, what opinions, what supposed facts are people sort of slipping into their memoirs that aren't actually true. Like when we think of mental illness memoirs, the traditional, like the classic ones, mm -hmm. um, Prozac Nation, An Unquiet Mind, um, even Susanna Keene's The um, Girl Interrupted have tons of misinformation in there. And William Styron's Darkness Visible. I mean, that was, I actually talk about William Styron's book in my book because he introduced me to the word depression. He introduced me to the DSM. I mean, I didn't really kind of register the DSM at the time, but he does mention it in his book, In Darkness Visible. If anyone hasn't read it, it's a beautiful book about um, his depression and struggles. But there's a lot of misinformation in those. It's not their fault. They didn't intend for it. They were going off the information they had. But if someone were to go to one of those books now, you'd think the chemical imbalance theory was real when it's been debunked. Yeah, Doctor's Visible. Uh, I mean, you, you, I've, I don't know. I've probably read that half a dozen times, and I read it again after after reading your book. And and a friend of mine many years ago was like, he just drank too much. You're <laughs> like, he yeah. drank. He drank a lot of whiskey every night and was thus depressed. And uh, so, but but it is, I, I think, maybe a, a portrait of not not just you know the the individual, but the time and sort of the approach to mental illness and, and sort of you know quote unquote. I mean, he he considers himself healed by Bach, right? At the end, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, but um, yeah, at any rate. Um, so journalistic memoir, you've answered that question. Um, I like that answer. That's good. Um, so this is kind of a two-parter. Um, and, and because, yeah, I, I, I loved your kind of nerdy research so much, you know, and, and, and the, well, maybe the nerdy punctuation stuff. The research isn't nerdy, but the punctuation stuff is kind of nerdy, which I loved. And um, can you talk about your process of, of melding the autobiographical and, and, and the heavy research and, and sort of like, when did you write which bit? Did you write like from all three strands in a day and, and, and how did you pull it all together? Yeah, uh, there's kind of a story that goes along with that, which is, I mean, the book is really about where I think a lot of people who've been diagnosed or love someone who has been are, which is that the, you know, basically you've received a diagnosis and you completely believe it. And I believed every single one of the diagnoses of the six diagnoses I received. And to the point that I identified with them, almost everything in my life, I then attributed to my depression or my ADHD or my bipolar. And finally, I was um, in my 40s and I was suicidal and um, had a falling out actually with Dr. M., it's a longer story. It's in the book, <laughs> but I went to a new psychiatrist that my sister found, and my sister is really the hero of the book, as is my mother and my whole family. They, as anyone who's been through this or knows someone who has, the families are really the heroes, and I'm lucky enough to have one that supported me. But she found a psychiatrist, and I went to see him, and we had the little quick 30-minute you know, consultation, and at the end, I waited for him to proclaim either a new diagnosis or confirmed that I was in fact bipolar. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you have. And my whole world changed. I just remember it was winter in Chicago and I went outside and like, it looked more vivid and it was colder and crisper, but I felt like a little bit stronger because I thought no one knows what I have. And finally someone was being transparent with me. And so I wrote the book I really started researching mental health diagnoses because I wanted to know where these diagnoses come from. Where, why did I, where, what is ADHD? Like, what is that? Who thought of that? When did it start? I just decided I was gonna learn everything about the diagnoses I'd received. And that research, I was really 
I don't love the word fragile, but I can't really come up with a better one, but I was really fragile at the time and research became like a lifeline for me and it gave me purpose. So it started there. And then um, the punctuation became the organizational principle. So there are 14 punctuation marks. So there are 14 chapters. And that's how that started. I don't know how I decided to bring in punctuation and the history of it. Um, my agent, the agent who I love and thank you for believing in me and for in, in the book, she, a lot of, I had talked to other agents and they, not a lot, but a couple had asked me to pull the punctuation. They wanted it to be removed and didn't think it would sell. And so, um, but the agent I went with, who's wonderful, um, she loved it and said, no, it's like a breather. You know, it allows you to take a breath and kind of come out of this heavy story. Um, so that became the organizational principle. And then I just really told, I think it was actually more difficult for me to tell my story. The research is, I don't know if you feel this, Tony, but like research is a comfortable place for me. So I think that that the exposure you feel telling a person your your personal history, it was like then I could hide a little in research for a while. Do you ever feel that? Is it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, my first book, I, I, you know, I had experienced the goal for, but I still went to the Iowa Library and checked out a hundred books or so on on you know the war and sort of lived around them to sort of shade me from some of the the sense of exposing exposing myself um which you know memoirs don't really like to do and yeah <laughs> the, the the great the trick of the trade i suppose um and uh yeah because i i feel like um correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like um it's a while we're in your book for a while before we really get to to that sort of um the Genesis moment when you're 12, I guess, when this journey starts and there's, there's a school trip, right? And there's a moment with your mom and um, I think you've come back from the trip and you're suffering some anxiety and she just doesn't know what to do with you. But you, 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 hold, you, don't, you hold that back from us for, for a while, which I, I thought was a really, really smart move um, because we're like you, we're sort of, we're, we're deep in, in, in the research and, and, and the facts were sort of living in in the research with you for a while before before you delve into the, the memoiristic. Yeah, and, and was that intentional, or was, was that like a few drafts in? I, you know, it's funny. I was just uh, listening to an interview with you at, about you were talking about Jarhead and that you wrote it quickly, and then your next book took three and a half years. <laughs> like it took you eight months, and then three and a half years. I wrote this book really quickly too. And it, it just kind of, I don't know if this is what Jarhead was like for you, but it just, it was just like, just coming. And I had struggled with a novel that went nowhere for five years, you know? So, um, so to your point, I mean, I think I did want, when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with anorexia at 12. And then in my twenties, I received diagnoses of generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. In my thirties, it was obsessive compulsive disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And then finally um, bipolar disorder. But when I was 12, when I, it wasn't like it is today. I mean, I'm not that old. I sound like, you know, <laughs> this, but you know, in you know, this was the 80s and 90s. And even though psychiatry was really talking about diagnoses and maybe some people were, they weren't, they weren't part of our culture the way they are now. I mean, we have this one theorist calls it the psych psychiatrization of language. When we talk about depression, the emotion as being the same as depression, the disorder, like we use them interchangeably. And anxiety, we talk about anxiety, the disorder in the same way. And it wasn't like that then. So when I received the anorexia diagnosis, I had never heard the word anorexia. And my parents didn't know much about it either. I mean, Karen Carpenter had died as a result of effects from it, but, and it had been in the news and that was the kind of apex of the anorexia age as it was later called. But we were really in the dark about that. And, and then at that time it was, you know, family therapy and my parents were blamed for it, um, you know, so. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, I definitely wanted that feeling. I didn't know the diagnoses I was getting pretty much every single time. I didn't, I had not heard about them. And I certainly didn't go in requesting one, like as happens today, because 
they're much more in the public, you know, discourse. Right. I mean, some people may maybe uh, you know, it's like the the people who have their uh, medical degrees from Google, and then they walk into a doctor and they they know what's wrong with them already, which I know drives physicians crazy. But it seems like psychiatry might be a little more open to these self you know, the self diagnostic tools and and someone presenting and sort of already. I, I don't know. Do you do you think that's true? That, that because well, you, culturally we're so aware. You just use such a great word, which I didn't know, and I wish I had known, and I hope everyone who's going through this will know, but this word presenting. So the first time I heard that, I was in an outpatient hospitalization, a uh, partial hospitalization program, and the I was it was my last day, and I was leaving, and my therapist at the time in the um, partial hospitalization program, she, she was really sweet and just all sunshine and, you know, this lovely woman. And I said, do you think I have bipolar disorder? Do you think I really am bipolar? And that's really interesting language to use. I am bipolar, like it is me. I mean, that's where I was in my head. It was 100% my identity. And she looked at me and she said, well, I don't give you your diagnosis, but I never thought you presented as someone with bipolar. And I said, well, what does that mean, present? And I didn't know that all clinicians are going on is what you seem like. I mean, how we seem walking into their offices. And the problem is that there, I mean, when I say that, you know, or I say in the book and, and we talk about this, um, that psychiatric diagnoses are invalid and unreliable. Invalid just means that there's, you know, no biological marker to say otherwise. So if I think I have, so one, one really good comparison is diabetes, that's a favorite. And we like to say that mental health disorders are the same as physical disorders or, you know, and, you know, met, uh, psychiatry is the same as physical medicine. And that comes from a good place, which is we all want to take care of our mental health. And that's a great thing. And we want to be able to take mental health days. And that's a great thing. But they really aren't the same because you can't prove a psychiatric diagnosis with anything. There's no test, no x-ray, nothing. And so the, the comparison being diabetes, I can be very thirsty and pee a lot and um, get faint from hunger and think I have diabetes. And I can go into a doctor and say, I have diabetes. And he can say, no, you don't. And here's the test. But if I go in saying, I, you know, I worry all the time and I'm having trouble sleeping and um, you know, I'm, I'm ruminating a lot and I'm having you know, some sort of panic and I get a generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder diagnosis, I can't test that. So that's that's the the so, so the, the patient can present as you said a narrative of of um and in, 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 yeah um so I, I'm gonna jump really quickly to the Q and A maybe and then we'll okay. pop back with so uh, Laura Larosa says um, thank you for your story my question is about putting a framework around mental health illness you mentioned mental illness is real if we don't have a name for it the best way we can name it, how do we treat it? Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, the subtitle of my book is The True Story of Six Misdiagnoses. And someone asked me, why did you use the term misdiagnoses if you're questioning the diagnoses in the DSM pretty much across the board? Exceptions are dementia and rare chromosomal disorders, though those have some biological markers. Um, but why did I use the term misdiagnoses? And a misdiagnosis is um, inaccurate, incorrect, or inadequate. And that's what I feel all the diagnoses in the DSM are. So on some level, they're, they might be inadequate or inaccurate or just plain incorrect, but it's gonna fluctuate among those um, terms. But I, I'm really comfortable, as I said, with the term mental illness and I, I had one, I don't believe they're chronic, um, and I believe I've fully healed from it. But uh, I, I don't, some people find that word to be loaded. I don't I'm, I take a lot of pride. I feel very proud of having had a mental illness and survived it. And I think people with mental illnesses are some of the strongest people around and deserve a lot of credit. So I, you know, I don't have a great answer. I think right now, what we need to do and what my book calls for is to give everyone all the information in this book and to make sure that patients are more empowered than they are right now and that their families are more empowered. And that if we know, okay, diagnoses are what we have 
this is what we have to deal with. This is what we have to work with. Okay. And they're not necessary. They're not valid. They're rarely reliable. Maybe this seems right. Maybe this feels right. Maybe I do have major depressive disorder, or maybe I am grieving the loss of my parent and it's understandable given the context. So I'm not going to adopt this diagnosis that they're going to tell me is biological, which no DSM diagnosis has been proven to be. They're going to tell me is chronic, which no DSM diagnosis has been proven to be. And instead, I'm just going to honor this grief that I feel. Or maybe you're grieving losing a job or, you know, I grieved for two years after losing my cat, after my cat died. And that's in the book. And I was told I had major depressive disorder. Um, we now have prolonged grief disorder, which is a new way you can get a diagnosis. Um, but hope that answers your question. I don't know if that was a good answer, but basically people knowing the limitations of these diagnoses, I think will help. So, um, well, I'm going to ask one quick question and then go back to the, to the Q&A here. But um, you, you use the term placeholder in terms of, of diagnoses in general. So, but do, do you think that um, the, place co- the placeholders can help? Is, is there, and, and how might they, they help? I think, and again, I'm not trying to take anyone's diagnosis away from them. Diagnoses were really important to me. And if someone had, if I'd read this book at certain points in my life, I would have probably not been able to read it, to be honest, because I really identified with my diagnosis. I wanted it desperately to help me and give me the answers I felt I needed um, and the help that I needed. And it, the, diagnoses can be very empowering. I mean, the autism community is a great example. They really rally around each other. They really, their, their diagnoses empower them. You know, being neuroatypical uh, is, you know, again, a source of strength for them. And that's wonderful. What I've seen more often and what happened with me is that with other diagnoses, they're assigned, you know, they kind of proved my weakness or every emotion, thought, and behavior that I had was because of a diagnosis. Um, And that's where we get into trouble is when we're over-identifying with them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to go, so Christine uh, Monholan, uh, it's a pretty long statement, but uh, she worked as a grief therapist. And um, when she related to clients that they were grieving rather than depressed, many, if not most, told me how fundamentally that shifted their understanding of their experience and their healing trajectory, which is sort of like your moment when um, the psychiatrist says to you, uh, I don't, you know, we don't know what's wrong with you, right? Uh, sorry, yeah. that was annoying. Um, well, yeah. Um, the Ariel might be able to put this in the chat too, a link to this, but Alan Francis, who was, the, I mentioned him in the, in the prologue, but he was chair of the DSM-4 task force and has been extremely critical of his own work. And, and really, he also put out a book called Saving Normal that he apologized for the mistakes that the DSM-4 made, particularly in terms of making bipolar 2, ADHD, and autism very easy to diagnose. Um, But anyway, so he just put out, he has an article in Psychiatric Times today about prolonged grief disorder. And to your point, Christine, what he says is that you're, we're really doing, um, we're, we're not giving grief the dignity that it deserves by calling it a mental health disorder. And that, you know, you've, you've loved this person. I mean, if, you know, if you've been a, you've had a partner for 50 years, (laughs) I don't know how long is normal to grieve that. I just can't even, so he really questions how do we put a, you know, a time limit on that and why would we ever try to do that? And that, that uh, prolonged grief disorder is coming out in the new version, right? It's a- the newest text revision is the DSM-5-TR and it came out on Friday. And okay. Very little has changed, which I find even more disheartening than if they changed a lot because they had almost a decade to fix some of the problems in the DSM and they chose not to. And that's really disheartening. So the, the, you, you've mentioned um, at least two uh, researchers, practitioners, um, you know, people involved in former DSM versions. And if there's essentially like retracting some of the work, if not if not the basis for the entire work. Um, I mean, where does that, where does that leave psychiatry? If, yeah. if it's indeed, you know, their Bible, so to speak. 
I mean, I think what's, well, there are two things that are happening. One is often I hear psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health professionals say, well, I don't even use it. And that scares me even more because that means they're just <laughs> shooting from the hip entirely and you are getting a diagnosis based on one person's opinion and you better trust that person a lot to take that diagnosis, but then it's not based on anything. So in some ways, not using the diagnose, the DSM seems more, you know, in some ways destructive than maybe using it. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, I have a psychiatrist still. I'm, as I said, I'm still on medication. I'm not, I don't think that pill shaming is an answer to any of this or shaming any type of treatment right now. If we know so little about these disorders and what mental illness is, anything that can help a person, we have to, <laughs> at least we have to support that. But um, I still have a psychiatrist and he and I talk about this. And it's a really wonderful, I, I, I respect him so much because he's completely transparent about all of this. And so I, where I hope this leaves psychiatry is that they have to be honest with their patients. But the other problem with this, and, and this is where my book will resonate with a lot of people because most, I, I didn't see a psychiatrist until I was in my 40s. So I was on my sixth diagnosis by the time I even saw a psychiatrist. All my family doctors. Yeah, it was all primary care physicians. And primary care physicians are doing most of the diagnosing. They write 80% of, of antidepressant uh, prescriptions. So those are really the people we're getting our mental health diagnoses from, for the most part. And they have little to no training in psychiatric diagnosis. I mean, the equivalent, as I say in my book, is binging on a couple of seasons of Grey's Anatomy. And, and it's done in inpatient settings with the most severe cases, when really what they're seeing is one of their you know, general patients for 15 minutes in their office, you know, probably with some sort of relatively minor um, you know, mental complaint or you know, emotional complaint. So you also, um, to quote you earlier, you, you mentioned uh, being normally distressed, I think. And, and do you think um, that for the 30 years, the, the, you know, the 30 year span when you received these misdiagnoses, were you simply normally distressed for most of that time? It's hard to answer. I mean, it's meaning it's just hard for me to know. I do know that there was a point that I crossed. And I do think now looking at that and myself as an example, I feel like I'm just the face of the DSM and what can happen. But I mean, if, if no one had said the word anorexia to me, I would not have gotten as sick as I did because I really learned how to be an anorexic. So originally I had a stomach ache. I mean, I had, I mentioned the pit in my stomach and I, my parents were divorcing. I was extraordinarily sad and I was going to a new school and I was terrified. And that was my context, but psychiatry doesn't take context into account. So if someone had just said, you're really terrified and you have this terrible stomach ache and you don't want to eat and that's understandable. And you're sad about your parents divorcing. Let's talk about that. Instead, I was told you have anorexia. So this emotion you feel means disorder. And so for the rest of my life, I was very open to seeing life through a lens of disorder. Um, but maybe if, if that hadn't happened, but then once I heard the word anorexic and being you know, in my teens, I was trying on identities and you know, exploring my own identity. I really learned how to be an anorexic. But um, I, I know that once I was in my 40s, I and I became suicidal, that, that that's a different thing. I mean, they used to distinguish between neurosis and psychosis. And that was, and suicidality was considered, you know, in, grouped in with, I mean, it wasn't grouped in with psychosis, but that was considered severe um, depression. And so there was just neurosis. So all of the phobias and, and anxiety and depression, those were really just neuroses. They were not considered, they were nothing you'd be hospitalized for. It would be only when you cross this line. And now that is our equivalent. We have any mental illness and serious mental illness. But what's happening is really, and, and this is something that Alan Francis says as well, is that what, what's happening is we have people with severe mental illness, serious mental illness, and they are the ones ending up on the street and in jails and not getting the care that they need. And a lot of care is going to people with any mental illness. 
often to their detriment. So they're getting overtreated and over diagnosed often. Um, I, I don't want to be uh, overly contrarian here, but I want, you know, could someone say to you, okay, Sarah, but you're, you're healed now. And so this took 30 plus years, but perhaps the practice of psychiatry and the reliance on the DSM healed you? Is it, what would you say to that? I wasn't treated. <laughs> I mean, it, I wasn't treated well, I should say. I mean, as I said, I got most of my um, uh, diagnoses from primary care physicians. I tried everything. I mean, I should also clarify, often we, as I said, we pill shame, um, but there's this idea that people within emotional and mental distress ask for a pill. They want this magic bullet. I wouldn't take aspirin. I didn't take my first psychotropic medication until I was in my late 30s. So I really tried everything. I meditated, I practiced yoga. I mean, I laid on the floor and felt my inner body with Decker Tolle. I mean, I did it all. And Chinese herbs and diet and vegan and the whole thing and none of it helped. And so, I mean, we could, I, the only place I get tripped up is that I'm willing to see mental illness as possibly being biological, even though they can't prove that right now, they haven't been able to, but I'm open to that. But to your point, if that's true, then I shouldn't ever be able to be healed. No one should, right? That's, the, that's what I don't like about the biological argument, you know, okay. but I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a researcher, so I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But I do know that what has made me well, which is the sequel to Pathological, is the new book, is um, has not had anything to do with psychiatry. Okay. And it has been, I would say, the pivotal point is not identifying with a diagnosis anymore. So my psychiatrist, who I you know mentioned with, who said I don't know, he gave me a diagnosis. I don't know what it is. He since changed it two more times. I don't want to know what it is. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't want to identify with it. So it's that's what has been crucial for me. Um, you answered one of my questions earlier uh, before I asked it, which was who are the heroines and or heroes of the book? And um, can, can you talk a little bit more about your mom and your sister and your family and, and how, um, I feel like you, 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 you went to your sister for a bit, right? And stayed with her and- I lived with my mom for five years and uh -huh. then really, you know, my, I mean, my mother was really just, I mean, I can't tell you how grateful I am to her and how lucky I am to have had her because I probably wouldn't be here without her, but she let me, she didn't just let me, but she welcomed me into her home and, and really allowed me to just sort of, you know, she gave me space in many ways. Like she was very good at not being, I don't want to say not being a mother, but she was, she very much treated me as an adult and someone going through something. And that makes it sound terrible. Like mothers can't do that or something, but, but I just, you know, she sort of handled, she just handled it perfectly. And, but she spent years on suicide watch. I mean, that's just not something a mother should, should have to go through. And it was just incredibly taxing on her emotionally and spiritually and everything. And so my sister really stepped in and, and, and took over again, like I'm so lucky to have her um, toward the end. And when I was very suicidal and just, you know, we had a routine and when I, when it would, come on. And when I could, and it was really dark, I would call her, you know, we had a whole system. I would call her and she would tell me what to do and walk me through it. And um, so many people don't have that. I mean, you know, when we talk about the homeless population and 41% of people in jails have serious mental illness, you know, what we're talking about is those are people who didn't have the luxury that I had, who didn't have those heroes. I mean, it's just so important to have support, whether it's family or, or someone else. And I can't imagine what it was like for them. And then my, my, mother, my stepmother and my dad too were just totally um, so supportive. And I was, you know, difficult at times and, and they just stuck with me. And I'm so fortunate. Um, there's a, I, I, 
I felt like I was reading a thriller at some times when, when I read the book, but, you know, which I which I loved, uh, um, and, and it felt new and and well thrilling in terms of a book of nonfiction where um, you know you're talking about uh, the DSM and punctuation and 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 your you know three decade journey, um, but I kept thinking like well you know for me the hook was will Sarah be okay like I I just I wanted to know. And 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 the twelve year old you getting off that school bus, I I was just like, is that young girl going to be okay? Because she seems like such a great kid, and and what's going to happen? Um, and did you you know as a did did you feel that you you could use that as a writer? Did did you you know like there's that great uh, John Didion, uh, you know writers are constantly selling someone out, and I always I say you know the memoirist has to sell herself out um did, did you feel like you were selling yourself out a bit and 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 did you feel that you did you want a reader to have that experience that, that I had yeah. which is I mean will Sarah I, be okay that's the, really what I wanted to know yeah and and I think what's what's still kind of uh shocking to me is I, I hadn't told it no one knew what was wrong with me I I still I mean I think I had just said I was, you know, the bipolar disorder out loud for the first time, like when I started writing the book. I mean, oh. it was just, so I was so uh, ashamed. I was so, you know, um, and certainly about suicidality, I would never, I mean, I knew there's a part of that in the book as well about how detrimental that would have been to my career. I mean, when I was writing the book, my family did not want me to write this book. They're on board now, but not, you know, at the time they were really protective of me and very worried, you know, about being hired. And, and certainly in, I'm in academia and, you know, as much as they're humanists, it's, you know, that, that certain diagnoses at this point, I actually just wrote about how the destigmatization of mental illness has failed because certain diagnoses are okay. Anxiety, depression, OCD, phobias, like we're okay with those. Those are accepted. But there are still those where the stigma has actually gone up, studies show. So schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar one. Um, and certainly I feel like suicidality, put that in there. I mean, what hiring committee, what is that conversation gonna be like if I've written about being suicidal or having all these diagnoses or something like that. So I definitely sold myself out. Um, and in terms of writing about other people, it was, it, it is interesting with your books too, because you sell people out. <laughs> so, yeah, no, but but I, I definitely, what was different about my experience is how much of that time I spent alone. I mean, I really, and I don't know how many people here have struggled with mental illness or, or feel this too, but to me, this mental illness is an extreme interiority that doesn't even do it justice. It's like painful interiority or something, but I was, I, I also, some people just close off emotionally and mentally but I actually really spent a lot of that time alone. So there was kind of no one to sell out <laughs> in right. some ways. I mean, I had two, two people I was involved with romantically and they're in the book. Um, and they were both really wonderful people and didn't have any idea what was going on. I just didn't talk about it. And then in terms of other people, my, my feeling is a memoir and my memoirist or a writer and my philosophy is that I won't tell anyone else's story. Okay. So I don't say anything that's going on in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. So only what they are in my story is, is right. philosophically how I've come about it, come to it. Yeah, that you, yeah, you, I mean, you, you tr your, your mother and, and your sister both, both treated, um, I guess, you know, very ethically, I, I would say, and, and, you know, with a lot of respect for sort of like what they're doing. Um, uh, what you, I think you've started to answer. We, we just have a few minutes left, so I, I want to make sure you say everything you want to say, and and um, maybe there's a question that I've missed here that you might want to hit. Um, Custody. Someone asked, can you comment on the use of DSM-based diagnoses? John asked this, um, in family studies or custody evaluations and divorce litigation, does your book address the misuse of the DSM in that context? Not specifically. I don't, I don't know enough about that. Um, 
I mean, I'm, I've read a lot about sort of how DSM diagnoses function in legal situations, um, but you know, I don't talk about that, although everything I say applies to that as well. So all of the information that I give about DSM diagnoses and their flaws relates to everywhere that they're used. So, um, so maybe maybe uh, one last question for me. And uh, what so again, I'm, I'm going back to that 12 year old Sarah Faye. And if there's a parent out there who has a 12 year old son or daughter who, who's um, experiencing something like you did, what you know, they they pick up your book, what, what do you want them to learn from it or, or take from it? You said, you know, at some point in your life, you would not have read, <laughs> read this book, and, and that might be true for families. But you know, what what do you want that parent to know, or that you know, that lover, that friend? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I, I you know, I, I put all the information in here that I want everyone to have, mainly because I want to empower people. But you know, it was it's been interesting to talk to my parents about this and their experience and how hard it was for them. So first of all, I just want to say for any parent going through this, I have just so much respect and I can't imagine how hard it is um, to be doing dealing with that. I will say I went for a walk with a friend of mine. She has a 15 year old daughter who was diagnosed with major depression. And my friend said, I just, this was before my book came out. So she hadn't read my book, <laughs> but uh, she said, um, I don't know what we're gonna do. You know, she was put on an antidepressant. She's gonna have this for the rest of her life. I don't know if she's gonna be able to go to college. I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know, I mean, what did you, I mean, where, where we got to slow down a little. And I said, there's no proof of any of that. I mean, there's no proof that the, any of these are chronic and mental health professionals are not telling us this and that needs to change. But I, I want people to know that no DSM diagnosis, again, exceptions are dementia and rare chromosomal disorders, but has been proven to be chronic. That's, that's one. And then I, and I started a, a public awareness campaign called Pathological the Movement. And that basically it gives three questions that I wanted people to have. And one is to ask any doctor that gives you um, a diagnosis, is my diagnosis valid and or reliable? And the answer to valid is no, because no diagnosis is, but reliable, you could get different answers for. Is, has this diagnosis been proven to be chronic? The answer should be no. And the third one is, what does this mean for me and my treatment or my daughter and her treatment? And what I hope will come out of that and what I wanna give parents especially is to ask for an exit strategy, which should become just commonplace, meaning, okay, I'm giving you this diagnosis. It's not 100% valid. It can't be proven. I can't prove that you have it, but this is what I believe you have or your daughter has. And the reliability is kind of low on it, but I feel pretty certain about it. I'm playing the doctor here. Um, and here's what we're going to do when your symptoms abate, when they lessen. And here's how we're going to take you off the medication. And here's how we're going to make sure you've got the therapy or the support or whatever it is. And that's called an exit strategy. And I do know someone who was given that by his doctor. And basically she said, okay, we're going, you're going to, you know, I think you have you're going through a major depressive episode. It'd be great if we started talking about them like that. Um, and uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on this antidepressant. We're going to, in three months, we're going to check in and then we're going to start to wean you off it. And, you know, and that was his experience with it. And he's fine now. So no, I, I love that thinking about it is possibly, you know, this could be episodic and, yeah. and also, you know, right out, you know, from, from, from the front saying, you know, giving this narrative framework to it, there, there is an exit that that's, it sounds both brilliant. Um, well, thanks so much, uh, everyone. Buy the book, give it to your friends. Uh, Sarah also has a great Substack that I've been checking out. Uh, and it's called Start, Start with a Question, is my Substack. Yeah, say it again. Sorry. Start with a question, and every oh, yeah. week I start with a question and then answer it or try it. Yeah, there's great stuff there, too. But buy the book first from Powell's. Okay, I'm done with yes, it. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. Thanks for being here, Tony. That was uh, a great chat. We really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, uh, as Tony said, um, 
you can buy Pathological anywhere. We'd love it if you went to pals.com and picked up a copy. You can also find Tony's books there while you're there. And you can see our calendar of upcoming events, um, which we hope to see you at um, soon. Um, thank you again, both. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank right. you.